<laughs> now we're live. Now we're live. Hi, we are The Union and we have real talk about personal growth. And this week we have Laura Jack back on and we also have Stella Hunt back on and we love both these people and I think they'll love each other and we'll just have like a love fest today. <laughs> Plus other things happen where, never mind, we'll have a love fest. So. <laughs> Laura is an emotional leadership expert and best-selling author of The Compassion Code, which I have on my Audible. I have not yet read it, but I will. Soon. Uh, soon. Um, yeah. Laura is a mastery level transformational life coach, speaker, and trainer for the Grief Recovery Institute. She teaches compassionate communication and how we can relate to one another more effectively during the challenging moments in life. Her mission is to cultivate a culture of compassion starting with self. She specializes in healing relationships so you can live and lead with purpose, connection, and compassion. Pierce, uh, who um, would, could also be uh, referred to as they or them, holds an M, uh, a master's in education from the Institute for Humane Education. Their research was a study of activist education programs throughout the country and continue to study social emotional learning activism and social justice. They grew up in the occupied Lenape territory of New York and New Jersey. Lenape territory of New York and New Jersey and currently live in an eco van traveling the country and speaking at schools and other venues. You're not even in this country right now. That's a cool thing. <laughs> they work from the frame that individualist social emotional learning is insufficient. Our capacity to have fulfilling lives and relationships cannot come at the expense of other communities' abilities to do the same. If our peace, love, light, and whole child education movements do not address systemic injustice, then they are none of those things. Thank you. Union show creator Keith Paulino is a master coach with over 4,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching under his belt and has taught over 1,000 students on the subjects of sex, dating, relationships, and intimacy. His main purpose is to help emotionally adolescent adults grow into becoming fully expressed and integrated. My name is Cindy Riak and I'm based in Silicon Valley. I coach startup founders and entrepreneurs increase their relational intelligence so that their investment and connections create the success they're looking for. I'm also a filmmaker and I tell stories that connect us as human beings more deeply. So today we're talking about using humility as a tool for growth. Mm. What does that mean? That is a damn good question. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening world. Welcome to the show this week. Um, so I think that, you know, our, our thread this week was um, there's a lot going on around kind of learning lessons through, um, we'll just say life kicking our ass in various ways. And, uh, and, and that can be, what, when, especially when you're beginning your journey, that can be um, a source of great frustration. It can feel like you are stuck or moving backwards um, and it can be very challenging to see, um, you know, what's, what's happening in there. You know, how are we showing up to that place? And um, there is a, a way that when we cultivate some humility about our experience, about how we're showing up, about our choices, about our actions, uh, that we learn a lot about ourselves and uh, we learn enough over time that we can make different choices or have different behavior um, so that one of those ways to kind of show up inside that stuckness or that frustration is is humility and understanding that we are not perfect and we are sometimes wrong and um, and that doesn't mean that we're bad that isn't a place to punish ourselves but rather um, a, a place to have inquiry is an option there so that's kind of the overview and we'll get everybody's individual take on the topic um, this week we'll go by who was on time and who was not. So Pierce, <laughs> uh, would like to give us a minute about you. But we're not shaming anybody in yeah. here. <laughs> no, I am totally direct and not passive aggressive in any way ever. <laughs> you have so much humility, it astounds me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, what about people who get interrupted in the middle of their... No, he just lost his slot. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I honestly don't care who goes. Somebody go. Pierce. <laughs> Pierce can go. Okay, I'm at the library and they told me that the speaker was a little loud. I might switch to earphones if need be. Okay. Um, but, uh, okay, so... Uh, Your viewpoint on today's topic. How are you on it? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about um, the ideas of, like, I, uh, before getting to humility, I've been thinking about pride and shame a fair amount. And um, I think that uh, pride and shame are uh, kind of... in the, I'll throw out some some Marxist uh, terms uh, or dialectical terms, and and uh, if I need to explain them, I'm happy to do that. But uh, I feel like they make enough intuitive sense too. Um, that there's uh, pride and shame are the thesis and the antithesis, and uh, they're in tension with each other. And it's actually um, there's no way to get to pride to a, a space of pride without running the risk of shame. Those things are always uh, the two sides of the same coin, part and parcel with each other. Whereas moving into a space of humility to the degree that we can, that's the synthesis um, where we can transcend uh, uh, pride and shame and find uh, new kinds of space for ourselves. Um, and so when I think of then what does that look like for us? Uh, pride and shame and humility and all those things. Um, uh, my background in social emotional learning is in nonviolent communication. So we talk a lot about needs. Um, so when I think about uh, what does it mean to have humility uh, in the face of working toward collective liberation and dismantling injustice, I think about humility toward the strategies and the tactics while still being deeply grounded in our needs and the needs of others. Um, I think that there is a, uh, a common tendency in activist spaces to, to uh, disconnect from our own needs in order to serve the needs of others um, and call that humility. Um, but it, uh, more often than not is a kind of running from ourselves and uh, draws us into uh, compassion fatigue and, and all the other, and burnout and all the other problems associated with, uh, with overwork, which is really just internalized capitalism um, in, uh, in suppressing our needs for the sake of our bosses. But now we're suppressing our needs for the sake of uh, others in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, so that is some of the stuff that I've been mulling over lately. Um, no big deal. <laughs> light light work that he's up to yeah, yeah just light reading <laughs> these are my daily conversations i love it thank you <laughs> <laughs> laura oh my goodness so i'm gonna go real like down to earth like <laughs> not academic and just say that for me humility is being able to apologize when you yell at your kid and like, it's like, I suck right now. And I'm a person mm -hmm. and that's okay. And I like the synthesis for me is being like, I know I'm an amazing mom and I know I'm a shitty mom. And the synthesis, the humility is being okay with both and mm -hmm. knowing that I can apologize when I not, when I'm not my best and knowing that I need to sometimes forgive myself because sometimes it's just hard. And so I think it's that those two sides of the coin come together when you're able to have awareness around them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Cindy, you wanna go next? Sure. I I love how you guys are talking about like the, the paradox, right? Like. Pierce, you started with like the, the pride and shame and Laura here, you're talking about like, you're a great mom and you're a shitty mom. And um, when I was growing up, I was, um, I was just like really like um, character attacked. I don't know what the right terminology is around that, but it always made me feel like I had to compensate tremendously in order to have any sort of value or worth in my family system. And um 
And it wasn't until a few years ago, um, I was sitting down with an NLP practitioner and he was working with what he said, what he said, I, I had two gears in my system. And one was, you're the greatest thing in the world and you're going to do whatever it takes to be the best in the world. And down here was like, you're a piece of shit and you'll never amount to anything. And both of these pieces had to coexist in order for me to like be a person, a human being in the world. And I just, and then, and I couldn't take away one without destroying the other. And it just, it just wouldn't work. Like I would do this and one would crank. And so um, I just, humility and curiosity to me is like, the sweet spot, right? It's like the place where like, ah, like I am human and I have permission and sometimes things don't go well and it doesn't necessarily mean that I need to crawl into the earth and die, like, or whatever. Like I go, I collapse into shame really quickly. Um, If I feel like I'm attacked, sometimes my initial response is to go in puffing myself up and going like, well, do you know? I know way better than you do. And and so like, it's... um, I, I think this topic is fascinating. Like I, the, the sweet spot is really, really cool. And like, how do we, how do we cultivate that? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I would, uh, um, so much of our, for me, humility is about, well, as usual, right. Uh, about identity programs and, um, or rather lack of humility is about identity programs. Um, doing a really great job reinforcing themselves. And so those places where we feel defensive, where I feel defensive, uh, where I feel dug in, where I feel um, uh, like I'm explaining, uh, where, I, where I feel like, a, like an attorney in my life, um, uh, either prosecuting or defending, um, that that is a, a some kind of identity program trying to preserve itself. And humility is a kind of antidote to that that allows me to see myself for who I am, not who I wish I was or who I project myself to be. And that is just that very act to me is uh, a, a tool for growth. Um, it is, uh, you know, being the reality of myself allows me to understand myself more, understand, uh, allows me to have compassion for the person I'm interacting with um, and like empathy and compassion, like putting myself in their shoes and seeing how I am impacting them and being willing to feel my impact on them uh, as not just my own, you know, is it impact over intent? Um, and so, um, having that total experience allows me uh, it, that experience gets into my felt sense. Uh, and then as I'm in a different experience that is having a similar sensation texture imprint, um, I can know, Oh, this is one way that I show up kind of unconsciously or automatically in this type of situation and that's not how I want to show up or that's not how I want to impact people or the world. And so if I can't change my mind, I at least have the opportunity to maybe withdraw or, you know, slow it down or, or change it, disrupt the pattern somehow. So that to me is the like arc of humility is as growth for me. Can I say something about Mm -hmm. that? What I heard was like humility is really about acceptance of all sides of ourselves. Like that was kind of what I gathered from like what we all said together. It's like when we are humble, when we have humility, we are accepting all of it, the pride, the shame, the good, the bad, all like all of it. And being like having self-compassion and self-forgiveness for when we aren't our best and, and knowing that we're going to continue to try to be better. Yes. Agree 100. 100. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I would love to hear. Um, There is a a story uh, from a rabbi whose name I do not recall, Um, but he would carry around uh, in one pocket, he had a slip of paper that on it was written, I am but dust and ashes. And on in his other pocket, he had a slip of paper written on it was, 
for my sake, the world was created. And I know this story because my rabbi made these paradoxicality tokens that have that, those things written on either side of them. And so I carry this around with me uh, as a reminder of that holding that I'm an amazing mom, a shitty mom, and I always will be both um, that. I th- I have never, I haven't thought a lot about the idea of how humility, in humility is paradoxicality, but I'm going to be reflecting on that a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Can I have one of those? ROTB.org, Religion Outside the Box. Ah, ROTB.org. I love that. I'm going to put that in right now or else I'm going to forget. I'm like, that is awesome. Thank you for sharing. Mm. It's not often you see a true totem. I like it. Mm hmm. Um, well, so yeah, welcome to the union. If you're just joining us, this is uh, the union. We'll talk about personal growth. This week we have returning champions, Pierce Delahunt and Laura Jack. Uh, we are talking about using humility as a tool for our growth. And what the hell does that even mean? Um, and that feels good. It feels like we really dropped in and, and have some great definition for ourselves. And I, I guess it's you know, without trying to lead the show too much, um, my my curiosity at the beginning of the show is usually around um, how has the absence of that shown up for you before you learned? You know, what I I, I love hearing our humanity as an example for, you know, people being able to relate to us and and so that we're not these kind of experts on a pedestal, but rather like folks just a little farther down the path is so, um, and I can go, I could probably go first, (laughs) but I could easily go first because, um, (laughs) because I uh, am a stubborn motherfucker. And I really don't like to surrender until I'm like backed up to the cliff and both heels are off. And there's, you know, kind of no, there's like the sliver of choice remains. And so at that point I will, I will jump and and surrender and and we'll call that volition. Uh, And I do a decent job of not resenting uh, whoever had me backed or whatever had me backed up to the cliff. Um, including yourself so many so many years of um, you know feeling taken out of control by life or people and and not being willing to look at my responsibility for how I got there uh, not being willing to appreciate that um, you know I was stuck and circumstances were created uh, either through my doing or my unconscious doing or you know random chance that had me get unstuck and that um and I just never I never appreciated the you know emotional or psychic uh pain of growth um and so I really got to stay mad at whoever and whatever um and there was a a a true lack of humility And, and I would say that's probably true until maybe three to five years ago has been the kind of like growth arc and, and stretch on that for me. And, and that's not to say that in, in my most intimate times and, and, you know, my most regressed behavior, I'm still that, you know, there, that I'm not, I'm not cured of that by any means. Um, but yeah, it definitely, it looks like, um, I, uh, I have a, I have a lot of, power in my communication and so I can overwhelm people or kind of outvote people with my words and my volume and and that that is not always not often a pleasurable experience for the person on the other end um and so you know humility is for me in terms of what I'm still learning is um slowing down enough to feel my impact in the moment um and uh you know or if i haven't done that um 
than being, you know, like softening enough to be able to feel it and, and return to the point of disconnection. Um, but yeah, the main thing that it causes is, is disconnection, hurt, um, feelings of um, like, I so, I have my abandonment stuff is so strong, like I don't want to ever feel dismissed. And so of course that makes me prime position to be the dismisser. Uh, and so I do that fairly often. So that's kind of my, my short share on how it, how the lack of it shows up for me and, and how it impacts people in my life. Thank you. Just sitting with that for a second. <clears throat> Um, I'll go next, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting as you're talking, Keith, I was thinking I have the tendency to do, go the opposite way where I like will get defensive and don't take criticism well and like shut down because I already don't, I already think that of course, like, you know, as I've come to understand, like I already think those things about myself. So when somebody else says them, it's like when it hurts me the most. And, and so I'll get defensive because I'm like, you see that too? It's like what I'm really saying when I get defensive. You think so too? Like, I already hate that part of myself. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Or, you know, um, so when I was writing my book, for example, um, I shared it with a good friend of mine who I was like, I know I'll get the truth from him. And it was like in its early stages. And one of the things that I learned is that you don't share something when it's in the early stages like of creativity, unless you're like, if, unless you're really at peace with where you are in the process. And so, um, but it was so hurtful, the feedback I got, cause it was like, oh, this isn't good. Mm -hmm. You know, like this isn't good yet. Right. And yet was still there, but like, it's still like, oh, like so devastating. Cause it's almost like you hold out a little tiny sprig of a plant. Like it's like in some soil and you're like look look at this little tiny sprig that I'm making that's like blooming here and they're like wow you know and you're you're so crushed because you too know that it's a tiny sprig at this point so anyway I was like okay what it taught me at that moment was like I'm not ready for feedback I'm not really ready for feedback from other people who aren't going to just like nurture 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 the little seed right because I already am like hating on myself enough that I don't need any extra hate coming in at me. And so anyway, I worked on it and I worked on it and I got so many eyes. And as it got better, I let the reviewers get more, like be more people who I could, I knew that they'd be real. Like the first few that I gave after that little incident were the people who are like my cheerleaders. They're like, Oh my God, there's so much greatness here. Instead of like looking at what's not great. They were like the ones who help the help water the plant you know they like gave it sunshine and water and so it started to grow right and I kept working at it and working at it and then finally though full circle the person who I gave it to very early in the process once it was complete I gave it back to him and when he was like this is excellent it meant so much to me because I also knew that it was excellent so it's almost like I think of it as those, those uh oh I gave it back to him, and when he was like, "This is excellent," it meant so I'm much. hearing an echo. Do you guys hear that? Yeah, yeah. I think is trying to. Yeah, I'm just gonna do that until he's done. Okay. Um, like I don't know what's happening. I hear myself, which is strange. Um, anyway, so the point being that, you know, when I, it's like other people giving you feedback or criticism and that defensiveness before you've hit humility, right? Like before, it's like. The humility is also knowing that it sucks still, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I know it sucks. I just wasn't ready to hear it yet. And so, mm -hmm. it's, it, uh -huh. yeah, it, and also, like, it's when, when you're unsure about it, you want to ask people who give you evidence that it is okay, yeah. that it is enough, that it is wonderful. Right. And so it's, you, you want, you want that reassurance, I think. Right. Like, in those early creative stages, right? Like when it's still so, so tender, 
Yeah, I totally resonate with that, mostly because I write too. And um, I've learned to start really choosing who's, who are really good feedback givers. Mm-hmm. People who aren't just going to like demolish you without compassion. Like those aren't mm-hmm. really people. It, like for me, it was like, oh, here's someone who's going to be real with me, but they're going to actually give it to me in such a way where like I can actually go home and like start Do working on it instead of just being crushed. Yeah. Because I, mm-hmm. I tend, I tend to fi- see people who would crush me. And then right. it was, and it was evidence of, I'm never going to be good enough. Exactly. And it's interesting because that was who I chose first. I know this person gives me the harshest feedback and I thought I was ready for it. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready for it because that internal dialogue is still going, you know, it's always there. And I think the internal dialogue, you know, when you're talking about the two cogs, I, we call it parts integration, but when it's like, the part of me that is so mean and self-deprecating is just trying to motivate me in a really weird way. It's like, it's trying to motivate me. It's just mean. And so it's like, I've worked with like the voice being like, Hey, I can be motivated without the criticism, like without that mean voice. Like it doesn't have to be, you're so stupid. I hate you. (laughs) Like it doesn't need to be that way in order for me to feel motivated. So I think that, it's like letting the, the voices neutralize a little bit more and recognizing obviously the value in each other. It's like, okay, the one who's like, you're great, you're amazing. And then the one who's like, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. It's like, yes, they're both right. And like the humility is them both being right and them coming mm. together and being like, we mm-hmm. want you to be successful, whatever that looks like. They both want us to be good. One of them is just doing it in a really mean way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We mm-hmm. talk about that in uh, nonviolent communication a lot. Uh, it's uh, those are just the ways that we've the languages of domination that we've learned to talk to other people and to ourselves. Um, and uh, uh, another great book that uh, talks about that the, like the creative process, especially, is called "Orbiting the Giant Hairball," which also came to me as a recommendation from my rabbi. Um, but uh, it's all about honoring your creative autonomy uh, in uh, a world that values the bottom line. And uh, he, he talks about how like, we, don't, uh, we don't shame, that we often shame artists though for their creative process in a way that if we did it with other things would, would be more apparent how nonsensical they are. Um, so he uses the idea of shaming a cow to produce milk. I like this idea of shaming a sprig to be to bear fruit. Um, mm-hmm. Like the the yelling at a, a twig for absorbing sunlight and and drinking water and mm-hmm. not bearing fruit. The twig is like this is this is how I bear fruit. What are you talking? About? Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I like the idea of also talking to ourselves and having that relationship with ourselves so that we can. Uh, know ourselves better for things like our am I ready for feedback and, and yeah. that. Um, but as far as uh, my own uh, lack of humility and how that shows up I'm also a recovering stubborn motherfucker um, and uh, and especially as per uh, my occupations of privilege I'm recovering from internalized whiteness internalized toxic masculinity and uh internalized capitalism and um i i have been reflecting on how uh i believe it is uh it is a form of arrogance to uh the paternalism itself is a form of arrogance and so when when white folk uh talk to folk of color about what to do under racism or men talk to uh women and gender non-conforming about sexism or uh, wealthy folk to folk in poverty about capitalism. Um, I would, my analogy for that is it, I, I think it is a form of arrogance to tell someone how to brace themselves for a collision if they're facing an oncoming train. Like you can talk about like, you know, what is the best way to in technically and not just like stand there. Um, but ultimately you're dealing with an oncoming train and that's, uh, that's, that's the force that needs to be disrupted. Mm. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm, I've played through all those things. I went, uh, and I'm not saying I'm cured of it. Um, but I, I have, uh, engaged in 
uh, white saviorism, in paternalism, uh, in in racist, sexist, uh, classist behavior without any of the paternalism reigning. Um, and so it's, uh, and I think the humility then is uh, centered when I have to remember to listen to the folk most affected um, and that I am not uh, that. Even the ways that I do believe that privileged people are oppressed by uh, systemic oppressions as well, but I'm not the, the directly most oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so somebody said this the other day and I thought it was interesting. It was like the people who, and I'm, I'm curious for your opinion, Pierce, but it was like people who are oppressed should not be responsible for starting the conversation mm -hmm. around the oppression. Because like, again, that's putting something on, it's like asking somebody who's already been like, you know, suppressed or oppressed to like rise up even higher rather than having, you know, but you're saying it's arrogant to have somebody who's of a, like a privileged state, whichever privileged state that is, um, to, you know, be sharing in the conversation or leading a conversation. But somebody else was like, why should people who've been oppressed have to lead the conversation? Shouldn't it be the people who have done the oppressing? Shouldn't that be the people who are inviting the conversation to begin and so that's I'm, I'm finding that to be like two sides of a coin too because I and I don't know the answer I'm I'm curious yeah totally I when uh in what I was talking about I'm I meant more specifically uh uh privileged folk telling oppressed folk how to behave um but as far as like leading the conversation um yeah I would I would certainly agree that um privileged folk have a responsibility to be uh, having these conversations and taking actions more. Um, in terms of, um, it, we want to be mindful about like this, the how much space we're taking up and, and which spaces we're taking up. Like I feel very confident in discussing uh, all the effects of systemic oppression with fellow wealthy white males. I'll, I'll take up that space all day. Um, whereas if I'm in a room of uh, uh, working class folk of color and gender non-conforming folk, um, then uh, I, I'm not going to be taking up that, that space. Um, and so it's, a, it's about which spaces and how much space and that kind of thing is how I see it. And um, I think that uh, for, <coughs> uh, uh, for as privileged folk in terms of understanding uh, like that push pull of wanting to learn but not wanting to put it on other people to teach us. Like, that's why I love books. Um, and there's a, tons of great uh, writing uh, from, from people who are members of uh, oppressed groups and they have plenty to say about it. Yeah, I recently read Rage Becomes Her and it really opened my mind to all the subtle and not so subtle ways that um, being a woman in this world is so dangerous and um, frightening and um, disempowering, and and we don't so often we don't we don't see that water that we're swimming in. And you know, I <laughs> for a long time I used to tell my husband that I felt privileged to be a woman. Um, then I also know that there are a lot of disadvantages to being a woman. Um, it really. Yeah, books books have educated me in ways that I think either my community isn't able to have the conversation yet, or um, or like just like just this bubble. Like I've I've talked about the book to so many people, and they're just like, "Wow, I never would have thought about it this way." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know, right?" <laughs> like, it's I mean, that's why we write books and read books, right? Is so that we can talk to more people about yeah. things that, and, and without it being like, you don't understand, right? Yes. It's like, we get to choose which books we pick up and read. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know why I picked up that book, but it really changed my life. And I, I, I haven't had a life-changing book in a long time. So I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I have a lot to learn. You clearly haven't read The Compassion Code yet. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, <laughs>
Oh, subtle shaming. <laughs> <laughs> and subtle in humility, right? <laughs> uh, for me. <laughs> Can I, t- I totally, the only reason why this is okay because I know we're totally joking and it's great. And I have the book. I know. Wait, are you not joking? <laughs> I, am, I love you. I think it's fine. I don't care when you read it. I'm so happy that you own it. And when you read it, I can't wait to hear what you think. Yeah, I'll definitely let you know. Um, my, the very last instance of like lack of humility for me was just last night. <laughs> um, I get really triggered when Duncan goes to bed without me. I don't know what it is, but like I had... So there's a sale at Sur La Table and I like put it off and like yesterday was the last day of the sale and I really, really, really want a soda stream because we spend so much money on anyways. So I stayed up a little bit later. I thought he would stay up with me and he didn't. I went to bed and he was already asleep. And so it was like the perfect time for me to wake him up and tell him all the ways that he has disappointed me in our relationship. <laughs> I don't know why. It always happens at bedtime. But then of course neither of us slept very well um and this morning i woke up and i was like oh shit i did that thing again Mm. and i would really really like it if i could be connected to like my love for him and humility in a way like what like there's this thing that's happening for me like can i can i slow down enough and like be curious about what that experience is without putting it on someone else and blaming someone else for like the experience i'm having but like, I think it's like partly like the combination of being tired um, at bedtime and feeling like I need cuddles or like someone to be awake with me. I don't know what it is. So it's like, it's a very childlike state of like, I want and I'm going to be angry at you if you don't give me what I need. And it's like really, um, but I'm, I'm sitting with that this morning and it's, I'm trying really hard to not collapse into the shame piece of it, like where I'm like, oh, I'm a piece of shit and I keep doing this. And like, it's incredible that he's still with me because I've terrorized him for the last five years of our marriage. Like, ah, like, <laughs> it's like, so I'm, I'm kind of sitting with that. Thanks. Mm. My mom always said never talk in the night because it like never goes well and it I never I, well. unfortunately I have not been able to always heed that advice because sometimes it just feels like that's the only time <laughs> it's the only time to like <laughs> pick up all the dirt like right. I don't know why like why can't we do it during the day because <laughs> the talking? day is busy the day is busy and then you don't have time like you don't mm-hmm. yeah and the- there's that internalized capitalism again I saw you thinking that too <laughs> Mm-hmm. Can, I'm like, can you even explain that? Us. What is that? Can you tell me what that means? I feel yeah, maybe totally. like I should know better, but I don't. So I'm gonna. No, ask. that's fine. The, uh, it's it's the four eyes of oppression: um, uh, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Um, so capitalism playing out is uh, the uh, bosses uh, telling workers what to do and taking the uh, profits that the workers have created um, for themselves. That's the institutional capitalism, um, interpersonal too. The internalized piece is uh, all the things that we uh, tell ourselves to justify that. So internalized could be I'm wealthy because I deserve it, Um, or I'm poor because I deserve it, or they're wealthy or they're poor because they deserve it, or um, the value of my work is tied to how stressed I am when I am doing that work. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a big one. Um, So- uh, The value of my work is tied to how much, so if I'm, so that might be why somebody stays in a stress pattern because they think that if they're stressed, that means their work is valuable. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It's, it's really important. And the only uh, way that work can be important is if everyone is suffering under it. Um, I mean, hardship, wow. like being like, I have to work so hard because if I don't work hard, then I don't deserve the money I make. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's internalized capitalism. Right. No, I mean, I've been working through all this money shit for like literally five years. So like, I just, it's interesting to hear it with those words because it's just a different lens than the lens. I've been looking at it from like more of a woo, like 
yeah. the blue lens your is more like a social injustice lens. And I I, just, I am both uh, anarchist and uh, free love hippie as well. <laughs> I feel the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He speaks both the languages. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm learning. Yes. Ooh. That's the humility. Look, I don't know, and I want to learn. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I um in in integral theory land, they talk about how curiosity is a tipping point. You know, like you could stay trapped in one place, and you want to come over into this place. And it's usually from like stress, disempowerment, whatever, like the unwanted state is. And then like the wanted state, which is over here, whatever that might be, like the only way to come out of like that, like rigid, like untrapped space is like actually having a curiosity around that space. And like that requires so much humility, like of like popping out and going like, okay, instead of making this wrong or bad or whatever that might be, like, can I be curious about like what's happening for me right now? Totally learning yay <laughs> I think that's been like the thing for me in the last couple of years is just like recognizing like huh I always I teach this when I'm talking to like teenagers and other people too but it's like asking the question hmm what's going on here like what's this about and so like when I fight with Aaron instead of being like bah, 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 I'm like hmm what part of this is a reflection of me? And then also knowing when it's not about me at all. And like, oh, this is just his stuff and I have to love him through it too. Because sometimes I'm like, what part of this is about me? What part of this? Like, I almost am taking too much credit or like blame for what is his stuff. And like being able to ask the question, which is good, but then to be able to be like, actually, no, this, this actually isn't about me this time. This is his stuff. And I get to just like lovingly hold this space for him to move through it. Mm -hmm. instead of like internalizing and making it about me mm -hmm. right so it's like this weird you know figuring and yeah. Yeah. i've been doing a lot of that this past year just being like what if this is mine that's so interesting too because when you're in a relationship your nervous systems are so intertwined like it's for me like enmeshment is like a huge thing right like i'm just like what is his and what's mine and like how much responsibility do I have around right. even his stuff like because like there is a responsibility that I take when I enter a partnership like 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 his his distress becomes my stress and like how how much of it do I like actually take on or and how much of it do I go okay that's not mine and like can you go self-regulate now <laughs> yeah totally So I'd, I'd like to kind of bring the topic back in a little bit and maybe um, have it be a little bit more. I, mean, I don't want to dismiss what we've been doing because I think that these broad topics help inform and um, I don't feel connected so much to your personal experiences around this stuff. And so I'm just kind of trying to keep our audience in mind around um, you know, what, how has this impacted your life? Using this as a tool, not having it as a tool. Um, and what are some of the feelings, um, consequences, if you want to term them as consequences, some of that kind of like drawing it down to a little bit more concrete of, of discussion. You want to share? Can you give us an example of what that means to you? Because I think I'm not clear necessarily about what you're looking for us to discuss. Well, so like even if we were to stay on the topic of, of some of these kind of broader things, I think Pierce is really versed in. Um, I don't, I don't hear the like personal experience of it so much. And so I just think in terms of relatability, uh, as far as like our audience members being able to say, oh, that, that's me. 
um, giving more like personal accounts of our experiences tends to be uh, more relatable. I'm just wondering if anybody, you know, in terms of humility, in terms of, you know, these experiences that you had, whether it has been humility or hasn't been humility, uh, how that has, you know, uh, helped or impeded your, what you perceive as your growth. Some of these things. I think, um, I think for me, the, uh, the lack of humility uh, shows up most often as a problem when I am under the impression that I can make someone do something, anyone do anything. Um, and uh, whether that is uh, uh, in my summer class uh, or in online uh, social media feeds or, um, uh, or in, in conversation with uh, people that I'm trying to convince them about the dangers of racism or uh, what other oppressions um, that uh, that is when I get attached to that that um, that I that's when I get frustrated and that's when I start um, I already have been thinking that I can make them do something or believe something I've already overstepped their boundaries and then uh, when I get frustrated I'm more likely to do that further and I think uh, part and parcel with uh, uh, understanding what we are responsible for is also letting go of what we're not responsible for. Um, and I can't make anyone do anything and I'm not responsible for their actions as much as I would love to claim all that responsibility and then decide you do this, you do this. <laughs> yeah. How do you reconcile that with your impact? I mean, you can't make anybody do something, but you can certainly influence and you don't, you aren't responsible for someone's choices or actions, but you do, but yours, but yours have impact. Yeah. How do you, absolutely. how does that all kind of work in there for you? It's, I, I think of that as a living tension. Uh, I, I don't know that there's any pat answer to that one. Never looking for pat answers on that. <laughs> I, can I speak to it? Is that okay, Pierce? Please. Um, I, so I call, I think of it as like complete modeling. Like I can't make anybody do anything and I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to live what I teach and what I preach and whether somebody chooses that for themselves or not, that's totally up to them. And if they're curious and want to know more, I'm happy to help them. So like, and I'll use the most basic example, which is in my own home. I have been eating well, taking care of myself, exercising for the last my whole life. And my husband rebelled against his parents who also ate well. So I, I grew up in kind of a household where we ate like Cheetos and drank Cokes and all that shit. And, <laughs> and I like rebelled against that. I like became the healthiest person. I went to health coaching school. Like I became obsessed with taking care of my own body and recognizing it as like the vessel and the, the holding place for my soul. And Aaron grew up in a very healthy home where his mom was gluten-free before people knew what that was, like 30 years ago. Wow. She has been dairy-free. She's taking care of her body. They had only healthy snacks in their home. And so when I met Aaron, he was rebelling against that. And it only has caught up to him recently. Um, and like, of course, I always like encouraged and like kept healthy food in the home and well, fill in the blank thing. He also is the one who cooks. So he cooks really delicious, healthy food. And snacks are like where his downfall is like when it's like the middle of the afternoon, he wants a quesadilla and then he like falls asleep because it's not good for his body. Right. So anyway, like finally it's caught up to him where he doesn't feel very good in his body. And he's like recently, even just recently been like, you know, like, I want to be like you. I want to like take care of myself. I want to like eat well. Like, so I'm like, great. You know, that's wonderful. Do you like, is it, what are you looking for? Do you want me to hold you accountable? Do you want me to just like cheerlead mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. Or do you want me to just like, do you want me to help you find resources to figure it out for yourself? Or are you just good? And you're just telling me like, what is it that you're seeking from me? And he wants a little bit of all of them and that's great. And I'm happy to do that for him and with him. It, it, it's just, I can't be like, you shouldn't drink so much. You shouldn't do all this shit because then I become a nag who I hate. 
Like, I don't like that part of myself. So I'm just like, you do you boo. And I will do me and I will love you. And you know, unless it gets critical where I feel like I need to intervene and it just had never gotten to a critical, you know, tipping point. So that's for me in my personal relationship is like, just lead by example. So I'm curious. I'm in the same boat as you with Duncan, because he's, he's very English and likes his carbs. <laughs> well, so I guess my question inside of there is, um, is there any kind of, uh, like, where, do, where does like truth telling come in? Right. Like, like, yeah. you know, you have a certain level of intimacy. There's a certain amount of trust foundation in your relationship. There are ways that you, I'm assuming, uh, or can be curious that, you know, are you asking your partner to reflect things to you that you may not see for yourself? And, and how do you have that as part of this kind of humility loop that I, that I think I'm hearing? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I think that the foundation of humility is also truth. Like if he asks me, how do I look? I'm not going to be dishonest. Mm -hmm. And, but I also always ask like, what is your intention behind your question? Because like, are you seeking my approval? Like, what is it that you want from me? Which is, it's fucking annoying to be married to me. I'll tell you that. <laughs> because Like not only am I Jewish, but I'm also a coach. So I, every question is responded to with another question. Like, so <laughs> which is annoying and hard and he is amazing because he loves me and is willing to look within a lot more than he probably would want to otherwise but he also yeah. chose that so mm -hmm. um but he part of why i chose aaron is because he is so honest and mm -hmm. he wants and seeks honesty from me and i don't think that we would have it any other way but like i also like yeah i don't i don't want to be a I watched my mom nag my dad and I didn't like it and she, he didn't like it and she didn't like it. So I was like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be a nag because a nag isn't giving somebody the opportunity to make their own choices. Mm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know if that answered your question, Keith, but I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll I, add to that, um, yeah. I, that I, I think about, uh, in terms of the conversation around truth telling is like, what truth are we telling? Um, like, I don't think that I can access the truth of whether someone is good or bad or is doing good or bad, but I can say, um, when you do this, I feel this type of way, your actions are meeting my needs or uh, violating my needs. That That is a, a truth that I know. Um, and so I can, uh, I will gladly offer that information. And I think um, with, with the, the humility is, uh, I think is uh, really wrapped up also in boundaries in that um, yeah. I, th this is how it is for me. And um, like it, there, in nonviolent communication, we talk a lot about the difference between the protective use of force and the punitive use of force. And so it's like, if you uh, do this, I'm, uh, going to get up and leave or I'm going to uh, stop you from doing that or whatever the case may be but it's not out of wanting to hurt or shame you if we're in touch with that um, it's out of a protecting myself or others um, and uh, it uh, that sounds to some people kind of uh, uh, wooey um, but I think uh, it it really does contribute to our wholeness and, and uh, our, our peace with ourselves when we can come from that space. Right, um, because like the only thing I can know is my experience, right? Like, like, like using your example, Laura, like when I see Duncan eating really, really bad things, um, just go into this thing where I'm like, okay, like the only thing he can hear is my experience. So like, I actually would say, I'm like, I feel really scared when you eat that. Like, I know your dad died at 45. He had a stroke. Like, and I don't want to, when I see you eat poorly, like the only thing that's coming through my head is like you dying and leaving me behind. And like, and I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life because of your choices. And so like, you know, like the only thing I could do is just like go into that fear and like, the, the terror and like the like the hurt like is it almost like it, it feels like a violation even though I know it, that that's not the intention but like it just feels so much like that for me uh, anyways mm. um, 
And I hear love. You're like, I love you so much that I don't want to lose you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Keith? Well, I was just looking at the time and uh, thinking that maybe if there's a, a round of, um, you know, this part of the conversation often veers towards like, um, like how I've applied this tool, um, how, how does it work for me? Um, but I also want to give us time to actually wrap up. Um, so I think it could be kind of both. I think maybe our takeaway uh, for today can be anything you want it to be and with the possibility of you know, how, to, how does this tool work for you in your life. Um, but yeah, I think, it's, I think uh, Cindy, are you good with, with wrapping up? Yeah, absolutely. I was trying to find a place to land. Um, I'm like, I'm oh, it's, it's time again. <laughs> um, it's over. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, we do popcorn style on the like final thoughts part of the show. Anybody can go if you have one, no obligation to give one. And uh, yeah, whatever you can think of. Something. Brief and pithy is great. So we can chop it up later. <clears throat> use it for promotion. <laughs> um, I will go first since you know how I am. Unless I'm late and then I get in trouble. Uh. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that for me, the takeaway is actually from the very beginning, which is something off of what you said, Keith, which was just humility as acceptance. Mm. And... Um, I think I've had an interesting, I'm, I'm teaching a course called the Compassion Code Academy, and this week is about forgiveness, which is interesting. Um, but it's really interesting that I've had all these experiences come up where I feel shame, like the way I treated my son in the middle of the night when he was yelling at me, and um, just like other such parenting and relationship stuff that's very personal. And I think that the humility is, again, coming back to that apologizing and forgiving myself, apologizing to them and forgiving me Mm. Um, because I'm human and the humanity in all of us is actually what connects us. And so understanding that like, yeah, I teach compassion and yeah, I teach communication and I still suck sometimes at Mm. doing both of those things. And Mm -hmm. primarily I have to like remember to do them with myself. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. I think for me, um, you know, I, I spent the first, you know, part of my life having, or I have a, a very high IQ and a very low EQ. Um, so I had a, a lot of cognition about the world, but almost no understanding of myself and, and feeling very little understanding of, of myself, especially my internal emotional landscape. And as I have been on this journey for the last 10 years, um, I have, I have managed to raise my EQ, my emotional intelligence, uh, significantly and, um, and humility as, as part of that education, uh, internal education, uh, and, and greater access, um, humility is the, like, um, it, it's there's like a it's like a it's like lubrication for for my um, for the discomfort of growth I guess would be kind of how I would put it um, where like growth is almost never comfortable because of the emotional and psychic pain of deconstructing survival mechanisms. And if I can maintain some level of humility, some level of uh, acceptance, then it eases and soothes uh, some of that that discomfort. Yeah, it eases and relaxes me. Humility eases and relaxes me out of this 
crunchy mold that says that I have to or should be someone or something. Like in this moment, I need to be different than how I am. Mm. Or the situation needs to be different or this other person needs to behave differently. And I need to have some sort of control. And that control is like almost in a way the opposite of humility, which is like, I'm going to relax out of this and just allow things to be what it is and have more acceptance. Um, don't go into shame and blame. And it's really and really just like you're like, yeah. And like you said earlier, Laura, like I'm I'm human right now. It sucks. <laughs> Sometimes in the moment, but I'm human. And um and the more okay I am with my humanity, the more um I can ease my way through things. Thanks. Uh, humility uh, helps me center the effects of my actions and prepares me for when I fuck up, which I will. And uh, it, uh, it allows me to better integrate the feedback when that happens. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Awesome. So, Laura, you had mentioned a program. Pierce, I know you're tra <laughs> traveling and um, doing talks and stuff. Are you, I, are either of you um, making any offerings more recently? Or are you doing coaching? Or do you want to share with our audience what you're up to? Yeah, go ahead, Pierce. Uh, I'm always looking for venues to speak, uh, schools or conferences, uh, platforms of various kinds. Um, so I'm always interested in that, um, and uh, you can follow me on any of the media. Um, my I've got Instagram and Twitter. My blog is on Medium. Uh, you can find me by my name, Pierce Delahunt, uh, and um, I thank everyone. Um, LordJack.com is me that you can find all my stuff. I am, I'm also doing speaking. I would love to talk to you Pierce about some of your stuff. It sounds like we have complimentary things that we're sharing with the world. Um, but yeah, I do offer coaching. Um, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. I do work with groups of people. Um, so, but primarily for people who are wanting to learn how to communicate effectively and with compassion around challenging conversations. Mm -hmm. I, and my, and my experience or expertise is around grief. So, mm. and if you want me to come speak at your, wherever you are, you can connect with me. LauraJack.com. <laughs> thanks for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks you guys. I love having you. Keith, I don't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> There's supposed to be a live event that was supposed to be this month and then it just fell through. I'm going to blame Colin publicly. <laughs> He's on here, right? <laughs> I, I think you're watching, actually. <laughs> Cora just said hi to him a little while ago. Um, all righty. Well, then, with that, we will end our show. We'll be here again next week with two other amazing panelists and a totally different personal uh, growth conversation. So with that, we can say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, Facebook. Goodbye. Thank nice you. to see you. Goodbye.